Hey everyone, welcome to In Between. Today, we're looking at this fun, incredible, rotoscoped, animated feature film called The Spine of Night. I'm joined by the two co-directors, um, so let's have a little fun while we talk about this. For this, if you guys want to introduce each other rather than yourselves. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. We've never we've never done that before. I'm dying to know what Morgan will say. <laughs> oh. Well, I'd like to introduce everybody to Philip Gillette. He's a brilliant screenwriter who you know from Love, Death, and Robots recently, but also Europa Report and his uh, live action films, The Bleeding House and They Remain, which are all incredible. And... He uh, he reached out to me to make The Spine of Night way back in 2013, and he's been an incredible creative partner ever since. And uh, this is Morgan Galen King, who is the lead animator on The Spine of Night, as well as my co-director and co-writer. Uh, he is, and I mean this with all the love uh, I can possibly imagine, a crazy person who uh, taught, taught himself how to rotoscope in a very old school way, which led to him making short films, which led to me mm -hmm. meeting him, which led to us uh, making this film together. I thought you were just going to be, this is Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> this is Morgan. He's crazy. Yeah. He's all right. Yeah. <laughs> so nice to get to talk to both you guys because... I know Morgan, your short films, like the the between the two mongrel films, you can really see your style start to develop. It. I know the first one is very kind of hingy, very very simple, but then the the world of rotoscoping opened up to you, which obviously has led us to where we are now. <laughs> um, I'm I'm curious, could you talk a bit about rotoscoping? Um, for I doubt anyone who's watching this hasn't heard of it, but just in case anyone hasn't. I mean, it's taken on a lot of different meanings over the years, but specifically the rotoscoping that we're working on is when you animate based on live action footage that you've also filmed, like directly with the live action. Um, and and it's funny you mentioned the, the, the very oldest of the mongrel shorts. Like I, I'd always wanted to do rotoscoping. I, I mm. loved it from the beginning, but I was like, well, you know, how am I ever going to pull off something like that? Yeah. But there's one shot in that where I just couldn't get the, like he's twirls his cloak dramatically. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I just can't do this with this sort of hinge style puppet animation. And so I, I was like, well, I, I get my wife to film it down. I'll wear the cloak. She'll shoot it down the stairs. And then I'll have something where I can really try to get this sense of fabric. And it was just a pleasure to do it. And I was like, how far can we push this? And it turns out, uh, you know, yeah, ten, 10 more years of, of animation. <laughs> so. <laughs> so as far as I understand, when Exordium came out in 2013, you already just started the thoughts and processes in this, because I understand this has been going on for, what, eight years of production now, uh, yeah. The Spine of Night? Yes, that's true. Uh, yeah, it was uh, the Exordium was in a like the Machinima Interactive Film Festival, you know, wow. which I think only happened the one time. And Machinima doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. No. The best uh, thing came out of it, I, I assume. <laughs> I mean, I guess I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> um, but so that was in October of 2013, and that made its yeah. way over to Phil, and we were writing *The Spine of Night* by February. Would you say, Phil? January, maybe? Yeah, so we um, we talked. Uh, <laughs> I've gone back to look at the emails. The first time we talked was in was around Thanksgiving, you know, November of, of 2013. Wow. And pretty quickly we decided, oh, let's let's take uh, sort of uh, Morgan's raw ideas for the world of Exordium and Mongrel, um, build them up into a, a bigger feature, and we'll just we'll just get going. So we, yeah, we. I assume that we had started writing probably, you know, in January of 2014. Um, and then we're shooting a live action mm. motion reference stuff, whatever you want to call it by, uh, I think we shot all that April, 2014. Um, Whoa. and then just had a very long <laughs> arduous <laughs> oh animation <my> process. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you ever, do you ever go back and update the reference then as you're working from it? Like, or is it just, no, no. Well, I mean, we re-edited a few times, like over the years, mm -hmm. like there were scenes that we knew, because one of the advantages of rotoscoping is that you can do a feature, I mean, an, an entire edit of the entire project before, you know, you animate a single frame. But there are still some areas where, you know, like the, the big 
special effects sequences and stuff where we uh, it was going to be just pure animation that we didn't have reference for. So like, and then just some things where we weren't sure if we liked exactly mm -hmm. the edit. Like there's, you know, there were in the second chapter of the film, there was uh, a big fight scene in a, outside a cathedral with an angry mob. And for, in the original script, we had two of those. <laughs> and then like in wow. the editing process, we're like, you know, <laughs> we could probably make this one mob fight scene. And I, I, I think it made the film better, but so in that sense, um, you know, we sort of had the whole thing right from the start. Although, you know, as we edited it over time, you know, you could see it come together. We we did pickup shots here and there to add, uh, you know, some more detail. Yeah, I was going to call them awkward pickup shots. But the thing about the live action cut is you would imagine that if you weren't working on it, it's all very awkward. So, so like, <laughs> you know, it's like it, we have, I mean, some of my favorite things memories of making the movie were showing you know because we, we cut the whole thing live action had you know got temp score and temp audio so to morgan and myself it it was like there's the movie like let's show it to some people <laughs> so we showed it to some <laughs> people who hadn't read the script and hadn't worked on it and and uh <laughs> we were like right like don't you <laughs> like and, they, and to their credit i mean they were all like it's my wife and morgan's wife i think probably watched it and you know people who were our friends and they were like yeah yeah, yeah. but then you know, at that point, the bloom was just a piece of cardboard on the ground in the warehouse where we shot. So they're like, yeah, yeah, I get it. But like, what was that piece of cardboard? Like, like what was like, clearly had not gotten it at all. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty fun. But you, you must have had a, a exordium in, in as like a an aesthetic piece to be like, don't worry about these people walking around in the basement or whatever. It's going to look like this in the end. It, like did you take that then did you try and finance it through that or was it your own money or yeah so we started basically self-financed right so we mm -hmm. and, and that was because i mean to be totally honest we didn't even try to get it financed in like a yeah. hollywood way because i figured that anybody i mean i, I just imagine like that sequence in muppets take manhattan like where all the doors <laughs> slam in their faces like I, you know who <laughs> who would finance a very naked very violent fantasy the rotoscope animated fantasy film and not not only all of that but on top of that that's not based on a book by robert jordan or a book by <laughs> tolkien or robert e. howard like there's no yeah. there, you know so while exordium i clearly think is a brilliant short film i thought um <laughs> it's you can tell how i mean wrong-headed and also right-headed in my mind it was like a short a shortcut to getting it done to just say let's start we'll we'll put our own money in it and we'll just start um, which yes, was a shortcut to us getting started, but of course it then took us eight years to finish the film. So it was like a shortcut to a long road. Um, but yeah, so eventually though, we did, we did need to get, um, more financing. And so, but at that point we had, we had been animating for about four or five years. So not only did we have exordium, we had, um, you know, a sizable chunk of the film that was animated and colored and had backgrounds. And so you could really see even more than with Exordium, you could see what this was going to be, you know? Um, and, and that allowed us to get some of the bigger name voice cast who came on and, you know, unlock uh, the you know money we needed to finish the film, basically. Mm, yeah. I like the term unlock there. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a video game. Uh, yeah, yeah. Level yeah. by level. Yeah, yeah, level by level. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> unlock the hidden voice talent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Obviously, a movie like this, um, the structure is very broken up i've heard some people call it like an anthology film and um, i know you guys refer to it as like chapters of of a kind of an overarching plot um and it spans centuries obviously and something like that i don't know is it exciting then because you know you've got something cool to move on to next you know what i mean you've got this whole new world that you're basically building up with echoes of the past and did you guys produce it in that way or did you kind of take snippets of each one or did you just go block of the misty wood palisade, you know, uh, medieval stuff into like the more city structures, into the bird people? Like, well, what, how did you approach the kind of production schedule of that then? Yeah, I mean, we, when we had uh, when we were writing it, it was always sort of the DNA of how that was going to work. Mm -hmm. um, mm. We were really in, influenced by uh, Walter and Miller Jr.'s A Canticle for Leibowitz. Oh, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. I, I'm just a huge fan of that book. And mm -hmm. it served as a similar thing where you have like the, you see like the echoes of the past 
work their way through the centuries and like you know these mm-hmm. and, you know so it's like each chapter of that is you know hundreds of years apart from each other as you see like a post-apocalyptic world be rebuilt by like misty memories of the past so mm-hmm. in the um, yeah, in the, so in the script level from the very beginning, we wanted to have it not be purely anthological, but usually sort of an anthology structure to tell mm-hmm. a larger story in in the manner of Canonical for Leibowitz. So, and, and I think, you know, we try to work that into everything from like the way the design works, like so that the, you could see the architecture evolve. There's actually mm-hmm. one shot that we had repainted in four different eras if that I haven't seen anyone pick wow. up on that yet, but you actually see yeah. the exact same shot four times in each section as the world ages, but it's so radically changed. I think people don't parse it, but we, you know, with that and with the music too, um, you know, we ch- wanted to have it like build and evolve to become, to start, like it becomes more and more synthetic as we move more and more into the future. You gave up some of your tricks there. That could have ended up in like a BuzzFeed article in about 20 years, you know? <laughs> Spine of the Night reuses four shots. Oh, man. <laughs> Giving it all away up front, you know? Sorry, Philip, what were you saying? Oh, no, I was going to say in terms of like the animation production schedule, I mean, I think, you know, Morgan was largely in charge of that. But we were, we once we reached that stage, it was... I guess we did start from the beginning, but then I think eventually everybody was sort of jumping around and working on whatever, you know, shot was assigned to them. So there was no, uh, you know, there wasn't a, I think also as Morgan will, Morgan can speak more to this than I can, but like the animators that we had got so much more skilled as they worked on it. So you didn't want, <laughs> eventually you had to jump around because you didn't want it to be like, you know, the animation <laughs> at the end was so much better than the, than the animation yeah. at the beginning. So you kind of have to like, you know, smooth it out over the course of, the production period you know very wise yeah, yeah. <laughs> one one thing as well like obviously because this is a, a pulp e you know very like i think you said it before very influenced by bakshi's work like uh, fire and ice american pop um lord of the rings that kind of really just gritty rotoscoped fantasy world um, and obviously heavy metal as well like there is obviously with that comes violence, right? And I really feel like in this film that there is a real true shown cost to violence. Like the, I, I think it was when the guys are invading uh, one of the cities or towns and one guy steps out around the corner and kills one and then it's just immediately killed. <laughs> like, no, no question. Like there's no, no heroic moment here. This man just dies, you know? Yeah. And... I really, really like that. Like, you don't generally see that kind of approach. So I'm curious, like, what's the thought process behind that? You know, where did that come from? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's rooted on, on like, a deep level of (laughs) seeing, like, um, you know, watching G.I. Joe as a kid and all these, you know, Mm -hmm. planes are getting shot down, everyone parachutes out safely. (laughs) But but I think there's, um, if you're, I guess I think that there's a, it's a disservice to the audience to, that is often the case in heroic films or and mm-hmm. which is a big part of fantasy that you know that there's a that the cost of sort of like solving problems with violence almost always yeah. still seems like i don't know glorified and noble and i, I definitely mm-hmm. draw more from i think sort of a horror tradition where mm-hmm. like if you the guy who tries to you know heroically fight off Jason Voorhees with a baseball bat is going to lose. Like you don't, you don't <laughs> beat evil by pummeling it to death. So I, yeah. I think, I think that having a big, a human cost to it is, uh, I, don't know, I mean, I, I, that's how I think fantasy violence is generally more impactful because the, it's very easy for it to be like, oh, I'm just stabbing a dragon that that's mm-hmm. not real. No one cares about this mm-hmm. violence, or I'm just killing you know, um, a horde of almost human, proto-human people, which, you know, I love Fire Mm -hmm. and Ice, but there's a lot of that. So it sort of feels like those deaths don't count. So you just get, so I I wanted specifically everyone to be human and for the cost Mm -hmm. of that violence to feel substantial. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a messiness to it that I think is, you know, the word I kept thinking of when Morgan was talking was like, you know, a lot of fantasy violence and, and violence in the cartoons we grew up with is, is sort of clean and, and priceless or not priceless in that it's valuable, but priceless in that you don't pay a price for it. Like it, it is, yeah. It's, yeah. it's easy. And so, you know, I think that there is a kind of um, one way, like a lot of, for me, a lot of this movie was trying to do 
a fantasy story like a different way or, or a way that we hadn't seen very often. So making the violence messy and impactful uh, was a big part of that for me. But there's also this thing, to, and it's in the horror genre too, where it's like, yes, we want the violence to, to feel, um, to have that sort of moral way to it. But then, you know, you also like, you want the audience to sort of enjoy it. Like it's a weird, it's a weird yeah. thing, right? Because yeah, clearly yeah. I don't, I don't think that I'm telling tales out of school here, but like clearly like we have enjoyed making this violence on the screen. Like, like there's a lot of care put into that, <laughs> into those deaths. So you, and I think that, that to me is interesting too, that sort of like the, the ambiguity of being both horrified by it, but also sort of um, mm. attracted to it and like appreciating the, the bone crunching um, impact of it, you know? I'm sure anyone who's animated gore by hand, which I assume is, is a fair amount of people who've at least done it yeah. on some project out there, will can appreciate how incredibly satisfying it is to do work with like a lot of fluids <laughs> and a lot of like there's a lot of physics involved in yeah. all of it, and it's just it's a uh, it's just like the work of animating gore is mm. exceedingly gratifying. So mm. there's maybe we we loved it too much, but. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like your, you know, your hoodie Derek here is very famous for that kind of, you know, yep. just just sheer volume of bulbous and violence. And one scene from that that always stuck in with me that is just sheer horror is when the I can't remember the girl's name, but she's getting crushed inside. Oh, yeah, yep. And her eye starts popping out. Yeah, or or the, I always remember too. I mean, uh, uh, Akira is. Uh, massively formative i think to both of us but like the mm. um when tetsuo has escaped and he is just fought he's like beating those clowns up and he has that vision where he like falls and his guts just spill out i oh, think about yeah. that all the time so and he tries to like <laughs> scoop them back up i think actually we had a shot in spine right that was going to be like that but we yeah. it was one of the things we had to cut uh but there was like a very specific <laughs> man who had to slice and was trying to like you know somehow put himself back together uh yeah yeah. I do. Yeah, I think I I did reckon maybe there's a like a point of view shot of someone looks down and their stomach cuts open or something. I I have a vague memory of yeah. of watching that. You're totally right. When it comes to kind of fantasy tropes, like I'm pretty sure the orcs were only made to be slaughtered. You know, like that's their only yeah. function. That's you just yep. created a race. Have good luck, Aragon. You know, <laughs> and um, it's the same with anything. Like obviously the Wheel of Time and Trollocs and and any kind of fantasy genre that has just a, a horde of things that are just there to be blasted and blown um, and like you said when you're animating this I think you struck a really interesting balance of it does look cool but it's it's horrifying but it's not enough to be like god I really don't want to watch this you know it's just like oh yeah there there goes his face you know <laughs> especially um, Lord uh, Py oh, yeah. yeah and and his like melted goobler face is <laughs> we was kept fun over the years because we did that section pretty early on in production and every time we'd watch it i would think he's just not gross enough we, we did three <laughs> passes reanimating his face to just each time be like i think we could push this a little further just to wow. get it because it i felt like it had to be shockingly gross when you first saw it yeah so the shard of bone sticking out of his nose like that was yeah, okay yeah like, this... doesn't he try to like you can see like a muscle twitch when he tries to blink like he's because one he's missing one eyelid right so he, he in one shot it's like him trying it's, you know the reflexes to blink but he but he can't yeah there's there's a lot of amazing detail in that, in that close up. <laughs> that's another thing about rotoscoping is although like it is a tedious tedious process of of um and anyone who's done it knows how tedious it is like it is a slow process but like how much detail you capture then is a fine line to kind of cross. And like you said about an eye twitch or something like that, oftentimes like it's very flat or maybe one or two lines or something like that to kind of don't denote shape. Like where did you guys draw the line aesthetically as to, okay, this is too much detail or should we have a bit more? Uh, I'm sure the, I think the animators, the other animators on the film yeah. pro probably thought we were still going way too many details. <laughs> I, I find uh, like, my inclination is often to do to, to do more, but sometimes you just realize yeah. the shot is going to be so complex. So a lot of times mm. we just sort of use the, you know, there was like a middle ground amount of detail, a, a close up yeah. amount of detail, unless it was something that was really special effects heavy or where like the detail was really narratively important. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's kind of just a balance of every shot. Like, so yeah, each character sort of has like three different designs based on distance, like how many, mm -hmm. how many lines around the eyes we would do. If you're shooting reference footage, you've got a lot more uh, freedom when it comes to like choosing your shot, you know, the cinematography of it, the angles and everything like like that. And um, because generally with animation, you sit down and you storyboard everything first. Did you guys storyboard first? Or you just grab a camera and start posing people? How did it? We did pretty extensive storyboarding, but some of it was like, we had different storyboard artists. I did some, other people did others. Mm -hmm. And it, and some of them ended up being a lot more useful than others. Like some were beautiful images in and of themselves that were, but ended up not being really practical for filming yeah, live action. Yeah. They were more like storyboards for animation. So it was sort of a mix of everything. One of the advantages of working with live actors and being able to work with a camera in a room is mm -hmm. that you have this sort of improvisational energy that I think that lends to it in a way that it rigor, like very strictly storyboarded, you know, working from animatics and building them up can give you amazing results, but it doesn't mm. quite have the same group improvisation thing that happens with live action. You know, whereas, you know, the actors too, you know, as much as I can, as an animator can try to add personality and performance to something like having another collaborator who's embodying the role, like they're going to twitch their eyes and they're going to do different hand gestures in a way I would just never think of mm. to have them do. Mm -hmm. So I think that all yeah. lends itself to the process. <laughs> there are, even now when I watch the movie, so many details in the animation that I know came directly from, you know, the, the original human performance. And the one, my favorite, well, I shouldn't say favorite, but the one that always sticks out to me, the, at, the, at the end of the film, not a little bit of a spoiler, I suppose, there are a bunch of skeleton warriors. Uh, and one of them, um, like, points and hisses and, and that i mean that's not in the script that's just we were like you're a skeleton warrior now alex and he just he just knew that what what a skeleton warrior needed to do was point and hiss for some, for some reason it's so i mean maybe we would have thought of that on our own at some point but it, it just 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 what he did yeah. and it was it's one of my favorite moments in the whole movie uh and entirely based on that sort of just as as morgan says like the chemistry in the room of that particular guy feeling like like a skeleton warrior and knowing exactly what he needed to do um yeah it's really fun yeah it really does capture the, the kind of it's a really good um center point of of boat animation then because you have the time to go away and, and add all the details and control the environment that you want but at the same time it allows that it allows that improvisation to occur but because you guys shot this you know what 2014 is what six seven years ago um you then ha were animating parts of that and then you attracted the voice cast which is like the backwards way of making an animated film 100 percent backwards yeah. <laughs> we do things our own way uh so <laughs> yeah so uh probably the question then is wh what was the process like for those voice actors right like like how did that how did that work yeah i mean so so we had at that point done you know the animation was being done to the original um, performances so so lips were already animated it with a certain cadence of speech uh -huh. right so yeah all the actors and these are all largely the big name actors at this point so it's like Pat Oswald and Richard E. Grant and Joe Manganiello and and Lucy Lawless um you know they all knew that what we were asking them to do basically was more akin to live action ADR than it was to yeah. traditional um mm -hmm. you know uh yeah. animation voice acting. Um, but it was still, I have to say, pretty incredible the way they were able to make those, to, to both match the cadence we needed, but also make those performances their own. I mean, I, I, I'm still a little bit astounded. I was very nervous about it. I was nervous mm -hmm. to ask because it's a little bit of a weird thing to ask people to do. And, and then just nervous about, as Morgan was too, nervous about the process, like just had concerns that it was never going to, the two things were never going to wed properly. Um, but I mean, all of them did, I think, just a fantastic job. And there was actually, you know, more room uh, in what had been animated for them to improvise than I, than I had really even completely thought about. Like, in particular, I mean, the most obvious one is, is Richard E. Grant's character who, who wears a mask for part of his performance. <laughs> so obviously a lot, of, a lot of leeway there. And then 
uh, the also the the rest of the bulk of his performance is actually voiceover. He he narrates the sort of cosmological sequence of the film. So within that, I mean, we were rewriting that voiceover uh, up until like the almost the day that he recorded it. So a, a lot a lot of changes could be made there. And then with like Patton, um, you know, not all of his lines are on screen, so we were able to give him mm-hmm. you know some some leeway to 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 you know deliver how he wanted to deliver. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it, 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 they were such a, <laughs> such a nonsensical thing to say, but like really great actors can, can, uh, you know, take what seems like a very controlled process and really make it their own in a way that was really, uh, really gratifying. So yeah, that's how that worked. I think we bought ourselves a little bit of room too with, I mean, we're animating at 12 frames per second. So there's a little bit of leeway in there where it's not. Like where the lip sync, even though it existed, was, you know, there's a little bit of timing variety that's possible at a lower frame rate. No, it's true. I remember I was working on a, a short film years and years ago, and we had to, we were shooting in Irish, which um, we had hired this guy who said he spoke Irish, and then we got to the set and he doesn't speak it. <laughs> like he had to tape, <laughs> tape his lines to the back of the other actor, but yeah. he, he just, he couldn't deliver it. Like it's a very, you know, Malifious uh, uh, um, uh, language, like it's it's a beautiful melody of a language, and it has a very specific flow, and it doesn't always work. So when we had to get him back in for ADR, he's missing whole words, you know. And <laughs> thankfully, they're not big, long, three or four uh, syllable yeah. words, it's like a ta <laughs> yeah. or a she or something. But um, it just worked, like because you're not paying attention to the lips. Like most of the time, you look at eyes yeah. and, and this kind of area. So I totally get what you mean by um, allowing that kind of space to develop. And like you said about the, if you're animating at 12 frames a second, saved yourselves eight years of work. Um, (laughs) Eight additional years of work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) So I think there's only what, it was only maximum maybe four guys animating on this or four people animating on this at any one time. Yeah, me and um, often... Yeah, two or three people. I think we ultimately had four lead, I mean, me and three main Mm. animators. And a few other people would come in here and there to work, like they'd they'd work for a while and see if they liked the workflow. And um, as you can imagine, rotoscoping was very tedious and burned a lot of people Mm. out. And we still used, um, you know, it's still a lot of onion skins. It's a lot of keyframing. So it's a lot, you know, to sort of make it feel more like the Bakshi work. Like there's a lot more traditional animation stuff. Some people had done rotoscoping, but it was like drawing the frame mm-hmm. fresh every time, which was, you know, not in not a clean enough style for what we were hoping yeah. to do with this. Um, so I think we, we burned out a lot of people on background characters <laughs> over the over the years. And so my, my, my deepest apologies to all of them. But the, yeah, we had a we had a, a a small core group of uh yeah, me, uh Brit. Uh, mm-hmm. My brother Alex and Ian Densford uh, was worked for, for us for a while. So, which and I mean, two, for years. So, yeah, two of them went on to work at Minnow Mountain. They they went on to work on um, Undone, the uh, uh, Amazon's rotoscope show. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's pretty. It's fun fun to like uh, you know be able to contribute to the other big, big rotoscope project. You know, going <laughs> yeah, go over just send them off out the door and you yeah. know wipe yeah. the tear. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And <laughs> uh, uh, what drew you to rotoscoping originally? Was it uh, just because it was better reference, or you just found that like this is this is a style that I like that I want to work in? I, I mean, it was mostly the latter. I, you know, and Phil too. I mean, we grew up in the era where like, it was that small window of time and it was kind of everywhere, like fantasy rotoscoping. Um, I've, I've told this story a couple of times, but when I was uh, young, it was before you could just readily buy a VHS player. But my mom was the uh, head of the public library. And so they could, they had one there that we could check out and bring home on the weekend. And but the only tapes they were allowed to purchase because it was a public library were movies based on books. So, (laughs) (laughs) so, but what that so most of them were you know pretty dry BBC you know literature adaptations, but it it also had all the Rankin Bass and Bakshi 
Lord of the Rings stuff. And so, I mean, I just, you know, fell in love with the Bakshi look. And then that just sort of expanded out to tracking down all the rest of his stuff. But, you know, even the, a bunch of those repeated shots in the original He-Man or Rotoscope, the, the one where Beastman jumps at the camera every single episode. Uh, <laughs> so, like, there's a lot of those where... I don't know. I just sort of grew up in it. And then when I was a little older and saw, you know, heavy metal, the Tarna sequence was rotoscoped. And it was like the era where like take on me, you know, the aha song with the famous rotoscope video was popular. Yeah. So it's like rotoscoping was everywhere. And so when I wanted to sit down and work on this, it just felt like the obvious aesthetic that I missed that I wanted to yeah. try to, yeah. you know, put, you know, figure out how to reverse engineer it and do it in, Mm. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, my own kind of style. Yeah, I might grew up with it too, but like I, I don't. I was going to ask for me. They didn't have heavy metal at your library, right? Like it wasn't like they. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. They had rings and heavy metal. <laughs> it was. It was a little later. It was when we watched a bootleg of it at a sleepover. Like, and it was Ooh. like a my friend's older sister's older boyfriend brought a bootleg of creep show two and heavy metal and they spent the whole all of us just huddled around this tiny little tv fascinated <laughs> while they laid in bed and smoked what they told us were cloves but i kind of think <laughs> we're not in retrospect and uh but it was just a, it was a transformative experience like i it's one of those like you know this is clearly in my origin story nights where it was mm. it's just it it, it open the horizons for what is possible with animation to me so much. In, in, interesting, I guess, that they're both anthology films. Uh, yeah, I mean, my I don't my origin story with, <laughs> with heavy metal is far <laughs> less interesting. Like, I didn't see it. I mean, weirdly, my dad. So the the movie, I I believe this is correct, Morgan. That the movie wasn't available for a long time, and then in the nineties, it was put out on VHS, right? So, VHS. and at the time, um, I was into heavy metal music and i think my dad saw it at like i don't know suncoast video or best buy or something it was like oh my son likes heavy metal i'll get him this movie that came out on vhs so so i he just like handed it to me one day it was like here here's something for you to enjoy child uh or teenager <laughs> at that point um and yeah i mean it, so so i don't i don't have quite the same like huddled around it like some sort of fire of creativity that everybody's like but but that being said i mean it did uh yeah, I, you know, it was obviously massively influential, and the magazine is something that I mm. continually um, return to as uh, just like, in particular, in, in its um, heyday, which is just probably you know from whenever it started seventy seven to I would say around ninety. I, I would view. I mean, the eighties, even the mid eighties, get get a little dodgy, but all that early stuff is so just wild and like free and like just genre stuff sort of without the brakes on at all and i just find that endlessly inspiring i really like the word free there because you you're totally right it's just let's just put whatever we can on 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 screen yeah. here um yeah but so, something like this really needs you know for obviously to play homage to all these kind of influences and everything but also have its own original flavor um music is a really big component of that and i noticed on the credits then that you have quite a kind of few collaborators when it comes to kind of the musical process like was that always in your head did you have music picked out or you kind of brought people on to write it we'd originally started with you know, i mean we had a temp score that we put in that was kind of like <laughs> overwhelmingly drone oriented <laughs> it was i loved I it, it but yeah I, I liked it but at a certain point in the process i was like we we can't like we have an action sequence it can't just be like a like a crushing drone <laughs> under this action sequence we need to you know we need to bring a little yeah we need to apply yeah, it yeah. up a little bit yeah um, and, and so then we you know we but we'd had pretty early on the idea that we would like i was saying earlier that we'd evolve the soundtrack so we sort of we chose the musicians we worked with, you know, in a way where, you know, we'd sort of, we had like a uh, Peter Scardabello did like sort of the, the larger score that frames the film. And then each section had a different artist working on each thing to sort of have a through line with it. You know, I, I mean, we, we both are big fans of, you know, doom metal and a lot of psychedelic stuff, but it ultimately, and we tried some of that in there is, is like temp music. And I, I think what we, the sort of like neo medievalism and dungeon synth, you know, are both big movements and sort of where fantasy music is right now in a way that 
felt more akin to the the, the quality of the work as much as mm -hmm. we love that, that other stuff i've seen you know a few comments wishing we had more of a heavy metal style soundtrack both the movie and the genre uh but i i've always felt as much as i love heavy metal that i just don't think mobius and those guys sound like sammy hagar mm -hmm. i know people love that song mm -hmm. but I've, i i don't think they're like inherently intertwined so you know we wanted to have its own musical identity and i think and I, it was really exciting to work with like independent people working in like modern weirdo fantasy music so you have the the rotoscoped aesthetic of the animation and the characters and the design of them as well uh, you've got this music on the other hand but i think really what kind of ties us all together are really the kind of worlds and the backgrounds that you guys have designed there are just absolutely stunning like really 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 just wow i can see this as a real world and like you said as it kind of evolves through the centuries it just gets so much like just so immersively beautiful um and <laughs> you're very welcome and i would be remiss not to ask more about your approach to that the background designers and everything Oh man, uh, yeah. Because I want a big answer. <laughs> well, I mean, we wanted, we definitely wanted a world that felt, you know, like it was lived in, and mm -hmm. and every every art decision we made was with that in mind. Like there, mm -hmm. we have a huge sheet of all the that we had pinned up on the wall of what every character was going to look like, and you could see. I'm not a fashion designer, but we tried to to carry through like visual elements of like. Mm -hmm. You know, in the way that societies tend to evolve on the past and reiterate shapes and symbols so that it would move forward and still feel of a whole, so that it would feel lived in, in that sense. Um, you know, we'd, and the same with the architecture and as well. And, and I'd like to think that we got, that there were like nods to the other eras and other places that you see in the film mm -hmm. permeate throughout. So we, we tried to pepper it with that so it felt lived in, but also to leave it so like to hit just that right balance that when I was like when I was young and uh Star Wars had just come out and all the millions and millions of spin-offs did not exist yet like every I, I always think of like the cantina scene where you don't have any background on any of these characters you don't know where they're from but it's just endlessly evocative and feels like they all came from a place everything feels like it's part of a big universe even though it wasn't at the time. So it's like getting that sort of, it to feel like off screen, there is more world was the thing that we wanted to use a lot as, as part of the design ethos mm -hmm. too. And even in the narrative sense, we sort of pick it, pick up a lot of the sections in the middle of a, an ongoing event so that you can fill in, you know, we don't tell you how they got there. We don't even necessarily tell you how they leave. You know, so like you're, you're seeing a well. moment, right? Well, you're seeing, you know, like you're seeing a moment in time in a world yeah. without the sort of like exhaustive establishing of the location or like, you know, I think so often you'll see in fantasy works in particular, like they start from a map, like a map is at the beginning of a fantasy book so that you can start plotting everything and you've got like you know the game of thrones books have like detailed genealogies and appendices and i love all that stuff but i feel like in a way it makes you more distant from the immediacy of the world and so i think we wanted to imply all that was bigger without actually yeah. necessarily showing it yeah i don't have anything to add to that <laughs> <laughs> well i was i i, I have this like snarky thing that I keep saying about Boba Fett, which is that I don't think Boba Fett has got, has, he's never been cooler than he was the very first time you saw him. Like I've not watched book of Boba Fett. I'm sure it's a fine show, but I can't imagine that it's really doing, it, it's not making him any cooler than he was like, you know, for the very first time you see him. And I think that, that idea of uh, creating a fantasy world where you are um, asking the audience to like, put their own imagination into it and try to fill in those blanks for themselves. And, and, and I mean, that really is one of my hopes for the film is that, you know, people see it and they love it and they love it enough that afterwards they talk to people who also love it about the characters and like come up with their own theories. Like what, you know, what, what did these, what happened to these places? What happened to these characters? Like what, you know, what did they do before and what did they do after without us having to codify it and like canonize it in a way that, that I think leads to, um, 
fans arguing in kind of like a legal sense about like <laughs> like like what is true about Star yeah. Wars and what isn't, it, it, yeah. and it, and it like cuts off imagination instead of opens it up. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the other thing we should talk about is like the the um, the actual background painters themselves who we found, which was really an incredible process. I mean, there's so many talented background painters mm -hmm. out there, and I think a lot of the guys we worked with, um, you know, it was fun for them. Because a lot of what they do is concept art that that yeah. then doesn't it's not like a finished thing that you actually see on screen whereas what we were asking them to do was like make the thing like this, this is it like do the <laughs> do, do the thing it's going to be there um and so i mean yeah we were we were very lucky to find the people that we did so it's such a talented group yeah how did you find marrying the two together then the, like i know you guys did extensive storyboards but laying that out against kind of predetermined rotoscoped ac action how do you find that it was um, like compositionally often kind of a challenge to me. It's, it's you know, um, it's like when you're framing a shot for live action and you are just shooting against a white wall, it's hard, like you're not necessarily composing with, oh, we also need a cathedral tower yeah. as, as a, yeah. the, the top of this compositional triangle. And so it, it was sometimes it was a real challenge to sort of reverse engineer a good composition from mm. the live action footage. Like we, because we could just shrink it and move it and chop it up or split the characters. Like there, there was a lot of work put into making sure that yeah. background artists, beautiful compositions were complemented by the live action. But um, in terms of actually integrating it, you know, it's just a very, very complex premiere uh file project <laughs> you know uh yeah <laughs> you know I, I, we, we we chop them up into lots of layers lots and lots of layers i mean it is that's always the best fun is the, the end when nothing works but you you're praying praying now that everything comes together and <laughs> you know you look you turn the camera slightly and you see all the layers and you're just like oh my god what have i done to myself um <laughs> 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 but i think that's the real joy when it comes to like it's something that i think anyone who works in animation knows is that it, there's no such thing as a style you know when it comes to this medium and anything that you choose to do is is correct you know there's no incorrect way to do it and and obviously you guys have a big uh, homage and you've got a lot of influences and you can see that in the style but to make something i think feel as I think original as this does is really, really interesting to think about like your choices. It's not just homage. You're not just blinded by the nostalgia of everything. You really put in thoughtful sections as how the world grows. And I think that really, for me, like you're saying about audiences filling in the gap, because you don't answer questions, <laughs> you know, it really, it helps to be super curious about the world then and what kind of rules you have. And I don't know, during the making of this, you must have thought about what's next for your, I don't know if you'll ever make another one and call it a now, you know, your <laughs> shared universe of, of things. Um, what is next? Like, what's the taking a break or? Well, I mean, I finished we finished animation in March of 2021. So I've had, uh, you know, <laughs> <Give a break. laughs> nine years or nine months off or something. So uh, for a while, I was like, well, we're never going to do this again. This took forever. Mm, of course. And it's really hard. Yeah. But now that I've had a little time, you know, I, I don't think we do it the same way, but I, I feel <laughs> a little more ready to go back to the front and, uh, you know, tr tr try to, try to, uh, you know, stage one of these campaigns again. So I, I, I mean, I think we'll see. It, it sort of depends on if this finds, you know, a large enough audience to really yeah. justify doing more. Uh, and if we can put together a team so it takes, you know, something more like three years and something less like seven to eight would be, <laughs> would be ideal. I'd like to make yeah. more than one more project in my yeah. lifetime. So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, I, I think there's more, certainly more stories that we could tell in this world with, that don't step on the toes of the imagination, you know, of the, of the viewer, you know, like totally, it, yeah. it, it sort of ends on a world changing event. And I'd love to see what the, that, how that changed world functions. So, I mean, I, I think that'd be really fun to explore. So 
I'd do it again. We'll, we'll see if uh, we'll, we'll see if it works out. But you know, Phil, I, I'm out. He's gone. No, yeah. no, uh, no. I, I would I would absolutely love to. I mean, I I, uh, I didn't do any of the animation because I can't really even draw a stick figure. So it, it's uh, it's, <laughs> I'm more in the every other uh, aspect of it. But yeah. I, I would um I would love to go back to the world and and you know I think it is a it's as Morgan said like I I think there is a way to expand the universe that we've created here without falling into the same sort of trap of canonizing everything and, and you know, answering too many questions and doing that. I mean, that's really my, my favorite type of fantasy is the type of fantasy that, that does exactly that. So mm-hmm. being able to try my hand at it more would be, yeah, it would be so much fun. Yeah. I did see, um, exodium exordium, uh, years and years and years ago. I tried to think back on, cause I was like, Oh, 20, 13 my god what happened then and all i could think of is like coney 2012 and but yeah. that was the year before, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. before yeah. yeah and i was like didn't the pope leave at that year and as well you know all these I who to cast even my remembers mind. right i have, i have no conception of what happened in 2013 <laughs> other than us starting to work <laughs> together <laughs> i mean i dropped out of the world once we started this like i because like i'm working from the same footage yeah. that we shot every single day so like that month in 2014 is what i'm looking at all day every day for the entire rest of the production you've heard of the coronavirus and everything haven't you like (laughs) to be honest it was i mean i was following it but like i didn't even it didn't change an instant of my life for the first year because i just i was just working you know it's like i was sitting it was like at the end and it was you know i was trying to, they were trying to pull the animation from my cold dead hands and i was just <laughs> i was like but i think this one shot just really needs to her eyes need to be redrawn she just it's, yeah. too, it's old animation we've got to polish that one up so it was you know but, it, but then once the film was delivered the uh yeah you know, the crushing on we uh that the rest of the world had been feeling you know yeah. was, was very present I mean, I'd say even more present after nine years of not being able to go out and then suddenly you try to step outside and you someone puts a out. hand up. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd really, I mean, the dream in my mind was always, well, when this is done, we're going to tour the world with the film. And, like, <laughs> and it, it played everywhere. Like we were in tons of festivals across the planet. I would have flown yeah. to every single one. Yeah, I was yeah. so ready for like a global <laughs> journey but uh, that's why we have to make another one so that hopefully we're a little bit just a little bit faster yeah yeah Yeah, just a little bit well congratulations both of you um i've got to say give these people money that's basically (laughs) that's what they need to make another one okay that's what they need uh yeah listen listen to call give give us give us give us Oh man! Well, listen, I really appreciate your time, guys. Thank you so much, and and really, yeah, honestly, best best of luck with uh, the spine of night. Um, I had so much fun with it. You guys obviously had fun and years of regret, and also not regret. <laughs> <laughs> Life is complicated that way. It's yeah. it's fun and also regretful. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. It's pain and pleasure, right? <laughs> All right. Oh, thank you so much. Right. This is really fun. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna cut the all my recording there.